Let's start off with number one. Hey, Tam. Hi. All right. Recording. Okay, so uh, number one, uh, find the derivative of the integral of e to the 4x, uh, 4x squared. We see this is just uh, simply an application of second theorem. So we're just going to follow steps here. Let me zoom in a bit. Okay, so second theorem. We're going to insert the upper bound into the variable of our expression and then multiply by the upper bound derivative. So we know the derivative and integral notation will just cancel each other out. So we get e to the 4z squared times the upper bounds derivative. That's what p prime is there for. z's derivative is 1. So it's just e to the 4z squared d. Okay, any questions? One. Okay, so number two. Uh, number two, uh, if you had a physical copy in the classroom, I changed the problem to make it uh, one that we can have an easier time with. So I changed it to integral from 0 to 2 of 2x cubed minus k squared plus 2k. It says, what's the value of k that allows this to be true? So I'm just going to go into my process, going to go through power rule, evaluate the bounds, and then we'll just see uh, what is left, and then hopefully we can solve for k from there. Okay, so I'm just going to focus on the left side, just going to apply power rule, and then we can work in the bounds later. So power rule, and these answer choices are not valid as well. All right, so power rule 2x to the fourth over 4. k is just the coefficient. x cubed over 3. Two, uh, 2k are a coefficient, so just 2kx. Once we find our antiderivative, we can then work in the bounds. Upper bound first. This reduces to be one half. So upper bound gets evaluated first minus big parentheses, and then we do zero minus zero plus zero. And then ultimately we want the, the result of this left side to be equal to 12. And now we're just hoping that we can work our way down to solving for k. Okay, so 2 to the 4th is 16. 16 over 2 is 8. 2 cubed is 8. 8k over 3. It's going to subtract the 12 from both sides. Okay, I'll combine some like terms, push the k's together, and then see if I can solve for k. I find common denominators 8k over 3 plus 12k over 3. I get 4 over 3k. I'm going to add the 4 over to the other side. Multiply both sides by 4 thirds, or sorry, 3 fourths.
Left side cancels out, right side looks like I get three fourths times four, which is just three. K equals three. Okay, questions? All right, number three, uh, integral of x over x squared minus four. Um, this is too messy to do power rules, so it looks like we have got to go through u substitution. And our u value looks like a good uh, candidate is going to be that entire denominator. And that degree is suitable for what's going to happen because uh, leaving that numerator, x to the first power um, should work out because the degree in the denominator of our u value is going to be one higher. Okay, use substitution. We're going to substitute what I underlined in red. Solve for dx. Make my substitutions. Okay, I get the x's to go away. Push the two out in front. That's one half. Okay. We know uh, one integral of one over u is just natural log of u. One half stays. And finally, replace the u back in terms of our original variable. So the x squared minus four will go in here. All right, questions with three. No. Okay. Next page. All right, base of a solid is a region in the first quadrant bounded by the x-axis, the y-axis, and the curve. Um, but let's, uh, okay, so this is cross-section with squares. We know how to draw our base length, but let's get our shader region first. We're going to have to create our own shader region. Um, let's get this into something that's more familiar. If we solve for y, then we can maybe plug in the calculator. Divide both sides by two. I get negative x squared over two plus two. And I'm just going to clean this up a little bit, make it a little bit easier to to recognize. This is just going to be an x squared graph. That's going to open down with a vertical uh, with a um, y intercept of two. Okay. We can enter that in our calculator, get that graph to, to show up. It's just going to be an upside down parabola, basically, with a y intercept of two. Okay, but we're talking about this side, right? X axis, Y axis. So it's just going to be that little, that first quadrant, kind of a quarter circle there. Okay, so off of this region.
Okay, we're doing top minus bottom. Okay, the reason that we know is top minus bottom is because um, we have so, uh, cross section perpendicular to the x axis. So x axis is horizontal, perpendicular is vertical. Okay, so let's find the base length first. Top minus bottom. So the top is the curve, the bottom is the y as the x-axis, which is y equals zero. And then we know that uh, we're building squares. So our area formula is base squared. Okay. Here's our cross section formula. Integral from X1 to X2. Whatever area formula we have, we're going to insert in here. Um, but we do need to find the bounds. The bounds goes from zero to whatever the intersection is which is just the uh, you can use your calculator to find the intersection or you can solve it by hand. Uh, set the negative one half X squared plus two equal to zero. Look for that. Uh, look, at, look for this uh, X intercept there. Multiply both sides by two. So X equals two. Okay. So our bounds goes from zero to two. And then we just insert our base into our area formula here. Okay, make the calculator do the work for us. So why is the two the top the right? Uh, the top. Oh, uh, say it again. Um, no, no, no. Sorry, X two is. Yeah, we're going from zero to two. We go from left to right. Yeah, so mm -hmm. left to right. Yes, if it's if it's X values. Um, if we have a horizontal base length, then we're going from bottom to top. Because we're we're stacking these squares from this end all the way to this end over here. OK, number five. Trapezoid approximation. Formula is one half width, height one plus height two. The 
look at all your intervals. All the intervals are just one. All the same width. Okay, first trapezoid has a width of one, height of four and three. Second interval, width of one, height of three and seven. Let me just keep going down the line. All right, questions with uh, with five? No, OK. Number six, uppercase F is the antiderivative of lowercase f. Let me put that here. So that relationship tells us that lowercase f is really f prime. OK, so just to frame that context between big uppercase F and lowercase F, we have a order pair for uppercase F and we're looking for a, a location on the uppercase F. So I'm thinking in terms of OK, this looks like a application of first theorem. Final position equals initial plus displacement. So if I want to look for f of 2, I'm going to start with f of 0, and I'm just going to figure out that um, progress made between 0 and 2 of f uppercase f prime. And we know uppercase f prime of x dx is basically lowercase f of x. Lowercase f of x is root 4x plus 1, so we can just insert this root 4x plus 1 in place of this uppercase f prime. The rest can just go into our calculator. All right, so number seven. Okay, uppercase and lowercase f are continuous functions. F, uppercase f prime is lowercase f of x. 
Okay, so we know the antiderivative of lowercase f is going to bring us up to uppercase f. So whenever I see this notation, I know I got to go through a little bit of u substitution. Let a u value be what's inside the parentheses. Okay, so we'll try to convert all of these pieces to be in terms of u. Well, we, we may not have to, um, but we need to at least uh, start that process so we know what the coefficient is going to be, du dx. Okay. Make our substitutions. Push that three out as one third. We know that lowercase f is going to transform into uppercase f once we push it through the antiderivative. The one third stays. Okay, so we have the antiderivative, but we have to involve the bounds. What we don't want to do is we don't want to insert 2 and 5 into the U because the 2 and 5 are not the same, um, not re referencing the same variable. 2 and 5 is referencing X here in, ter in terms of U. So either we convert everything in terms of U or we convert everything in terms of X. I think most students prefer X, so I'm just going to push, um, convert that U back in terms of the original variable, and that way we can just use the original bounds. Okay, upper bound first. Five times three is 15. Minus lower bound. Two times three is six. Answer choice E. All right, good so far? Nope. Okay. All right, number eight, average value. So average value, I'm thinking in terms of average value theorem. My A and B values are 0 and 4, and I'm going to have to work this out by hand here. Okay, we'll go through a little bit of U substitution. Let the U value be 3x. And then replace that dx as well. Make the substitution. Well, let's see. E to the u times du over 3. So once I replace 3x with u and dx with du over 3, I see that there's another coefficient that we've got to keep track of. So I'm going to push that 3 out in front. There's already a 1 fourth out in front. So 1 fourth times 1 third is 1 twelfth. Okay. Uh, next up, the integral of e to the u. The nice thing about e to the u is the integral is just itself. Okay, we have our antiderivative. I'll bring this back in terms of x, 
and then I can rely on my original bounds. Okay, upper bound first. Three times four is 12. Lower bound next. Careful. I think that uh, we got to be careful because just because we see zero doesn't mean that it's going to always take our expression to be zero. So make sure that you are uh, convincing yourself and looking at it carefully. So here, this is not going to just be zero because e to the zero is still one, and one times one twelfth is still one twelfth. Yeah, so just be careful with a bound involving zero. A lot of times it does wipe all the terms out to be zero, but we can't. You gotta, you gotta look at it carefully. Answer choice A. All right, good so far. All right, number nine, solving differential equations. Um, cross multiply, get my variables separated, or at least begin the process of trying to separate the variables. And the good thing is, looks like just by cross multiplying, we're able to um, get full separation without any additional steps. So okay. we see that's not always the case, but um, we always do this first so that we can get these dy dx's in their right places, and then we can decide, okay, is there anything out of place? But it looks like everything is good to go. Y is on the left, x is on the right. Okay. We're going to apply the integral of both sides. Integral of e to the u is just e to the u. So e to the y becomes e to the y. Sine's integral is just negative cosine. And then plus c. So I think maybe it's just cleaner just to get c out of the way before we um, resolve that y. So I'm going to take my order pair and put in. using my order pair, power of four and zero. Okay, power of four for X, zero in for Y. Cosine of power of four is uh, root two over two. Add the root two over two to both sides, I get one plus root two over two. Once I have my C value, I'm going to update my equation and then work to try to get that Y by itself. So I inserted the 1 plus root 2 over 2 into the C value, and now I'm just going to solve for Y. Uh, what can we do to get Y by itself? Um, natural log. Yeah, natural log both sides. Doesn't look very pretty, but I think one of our answer choices will match up nicely. Bring the y down in front. Natural log of e just becomes one. That goes away. Okay. 
Answer choice B. All right, last page. All right, I see an integral problem. Uh, this uh, we're going to work out by hand, so I'm going to expand everything out, rely on power rule, go through power rule, uh, then I can work in the bounds. Multiply bases by adding exponents. 2 plus 1 half is 1 half plus 4 over 2, which is 5 over 2. 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves. One, and then minus 8x to 1 half. We have to resolve all those because if we want to do power rule, we've got to have all of our conditions met, right? No parentheses, no radicals, no variable in the denominator, everything nicely separated. Now we can do power rule. Add one to the exponent divided by that new exponent. I'll clean this up and then I can work in the bounds. Upper bound first. Uh, cleans up to be a decimal that actually can convert into fractional value. So I use my calculator to get that final calculation. All right, number 11. You guys good so far? Okay, all right, 11. Uh, we have region enclosed by y axis, the line y equals 2, curve y equals square root of x. That's just a um, radical function here. So here's square root of x, y equals 2 is a horizontal line, y axis. There's our shaded region. Rotating about the y axis, so vertical axis. We know anytime there, there's rotation, we know there's going to be disc or washer method. There's going to be circles involved here, circular shapes involved. So we got to make a decision here disc or washer method. Yeah. Uh, Dotted line is up against a flat surface. There's only one radius needed. Okay, but it's horizontal, so we got to make some adjustments here. So I will say um, this is this method. Right minus left. But we know this is a red flag because right minus left means most likely our equations are not in the correct form. We got to solve this in the correct form. So I'm going to solve for x, square both sides. x equals y squared. Right minus left. Right end point is sitting on the curve, the y squared. The left end point is sitting at the zero. So y squared minus zero is my big radius. All 
Okay, this is what our formula will look like for this method. Pi integral y1 to y2, big R squared dy. Our lowest and highest uh, bounds, normally we would have to set equations equal, but I think in this case we can just look at the graph. Lowest y value is zero, highest y value is cut off by that, hor that horizontal line, so from zero to two are our y values. Uh, the rest can go in the calculator, but we could also work this out relatively simple enough where we could go through power rule. This becomes y to the fourth. And then power rule y to the fifth over five. Evaluate between zero and two. We get two to the fifth over five. Minus zero, which is 32 over five pi. All right, number 12. Let R be the region enclosed by the graph y equals x squared, the line x equals 4, and the x-axis. Y equals x squared, that's a parabola, but we're dealing with um, what's going to be in the first quadrant here. X equals 4 is this vertical line, x-axis, and then there's our shaded region. Okay, we're rotating again around the y-axis, vertical line. All right, but now this for washer. Now it's washer, right? Because there's a gap between the axis and the shaded region. As this gets rotated around, um, even though it's touching at one point, there's still all this gap, and because of that gap, we got to subtract the hole out. Okay. And we have a vertical axis, which means our, our radius has to be um, parallel, uh, perpendicular to it. So our radius is going to have to be horizontal. So we know also this will be a right minus left. So if we want to do right minus left, our equations have to be rewritten, most likely. The y equals x squared. We need to get this in the proper form. Let's get it in terms of x. x equals square root of y. We'll extend our two radius. Big R of Y and little r of Y. Okay, so big radius is four minus zero. Little radius. Right end point is sitting on the root y, the left end point is sitting at the zero. Okay, so here's our formula for the washer method. Big R squared minus little r squared.
our bounds have to be in terms of y. So we can't go from zero to four, right? Zero to four are in terms of x. We got to go in terms of y. So, so zero is the lowest y value. How do I find this highest y value here? Maybe the maybe it doesn't have to be, be that complicated. Maybe we can just think in terms of well, what's the order pair at that point? How can I find the order pair at that point? If this is my y equals x squared, I can just put into the function and get that y value, right? So if I if I put four in for x either into this equation or into this equation, we can solve for y. So y must be equal to what? Right. If I insert 4 for x, I get 4 squared, which is 16. Or I can enter uh, 4 into the x here, and either way I'll get y equals 16. So that's my highest y value from 0 to 16. Big radius squared minus little radius squared. Okay, in our calculator, and then we get 128.5. All right, any questions? All right, 13, uh, a pizza uh, heated to a temperature of 475 degrees Fahrenheit is taken out of an oven and placed in the 105 degree room at T equals zero minutes. This 105 degrees in that, that room temperature is not really gonna be uh, relevant to us. I'm gonna just cross that out. Temperature is changing at a rate of negative 256 E to the negative 0.3 T or 0.7 T. Fahrenheit per minute, we have a rate. To the nearest degree was the temperature of the pizza at nine minutes. So this goes back to this uh, applying first theorem where anytime I'm looking for a final value, I have an initial and I have a, a way to, to bridge that gap in terms of the progress made. So I'm going to say final value. Mr. Yang, mm -hmm. um, I just put that column, the last one, in the Okay, try try again. You got it. You always have five It depends. Um, if the answer choice has it, then you do it. But if the answer choice has a decimal value, then you probably need to multiply that pi through. But if it's pre-response, either is OK. Either you leave it the pi, leave the pi as a value next to it, or you multiply it out. Where do you get the pi from? We got the, oh, oh, sorry. I didn't, I forgot to include it. It should have been part of my, yeah, yeah. It should have been in front of my disk and washer method. I forgot to insert it there. For cross section, we don't have pi, but for disk and washer, we do. Okay, so I'm going to uh, let p of t, I'm just create a function called p of t to represent um, the temperature of the, the pizza. So I'll say if I'm looking for the temperature of the pizza at nine minutes, I'm going to be using a starting point that they give me. So I have temperature at zero minutes. So I'm just going to figure out. What is 
uh, I'm going to accumulate the rate of change of temperature between zero and nine minutes, and that will give me the change in temperature. I add that to the initial temperature, and that will give me the final temperature. So P of zero, the initial temperature is 475 degrees for the pizza. Plus, this goes in your calculator. So over the course of nine minutes, uh, temperature is gonna drop by a lot. So nine minutes later, it'll still be hot, but much more manageable. Answer choice C. No, that 105 is sometimes um, with these problems. Yeah, you have some extraneous information. It doesn't happen too often, but that it just tells us kind of like the, the, the temperature of the room that uh, we don't really need. OK. All right, so thanks for being here. Uh, good luck with your studies tonight. I'll see you guys tomorrow. No problem.